Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil Vischer. You're listening to the Phil Vischer Podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. Hi, Sky. How are you? I'm great. That's fantastic. And Christian Taylor is missing in action. Yeah, what is she up to? Once again, what is, uh, I think she's still working on the movie. She's producing she, something in Chicago. No, she's uh, she's the extra wrangler for a movie. In Chicago. In Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. But she's not producing the movie. Sky. Right, sorry. She's not producing sorry, the sorry, movie. Sorry, she's yeah, wrangling, wrangling extras. extras. Like herding cats. Is what she's doing. Uh, so I'm going to just jump in with theme song. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Vicious Podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky, but Christian's gone. But we got a guest here who's come along. And we'll introduce him very shortly. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Vicious Podcast starts right here. The Phil Vicious Podcast starts right here. Okay. Um, our guest, he doesn't know that we do news first. So our, our, uh-huh. our guest is, is Keith Getty. Um, he's a composer and a songwriter and a worship hymnologist. Worship him. Is that from his bio? Maker. No, I'm making it up. He writes worship hymns. But that doesn't, is hymnologist, is that even a word? I think that's someone who studies. Hymnologist is a word. Yeah. It is a word. It's someone who it's studies It's not like a hymns. mixologist. Doesn't, it's not someone who been, makes hymns, though. I've never been called one, but it is a word. Okay. Well, that's good. Good to know. We're going to try to call you a few other things that you've never been called before. And he might call you some things. Before we get to the end of the podcast. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we don't, so, uh, Keith, we usually cover the news a little bit first. Uh, we don't have a lot to talk about and we have a lot to talk about with you, but the one thing that we have to mention, cause it's just crazy. And it's been a few weeks. I, and it's getting yeah. worse. Yeah. It's getting worse. It's like. I don't even know what it is. It's like when, I'm, when someone sets up a hundred mousetraps on a table and one of them fires and then it triggers all of them, uh-huh. and then and all the mouse traps are flying through the air. And that's you, what's happening in Hollywood right now. And you're referring to the mouse traps of Hollywood. It started with Harvey Weinstein. He was the first mouse trap. But it's not just Hollywood. No, it's not just Hollywood. It's but that's basically where... any any. I now assume that every single well-known man is a sexual predator. Yeah. Right. That's just how it is. Right. Every one of them. On on Saturday Night Live, on Saturday, they said, uh, no one is going outside because it's very cold and everyone you've ever known is a sex monster. There it is. That's it. I'd like everyone to know, however, I've been on this show for, what, five years now? Yeah. And no one has ever grabbed me inappropriately. On the show or but like in this, any context? This, this, this little celebrity incubator we've okay. created okay. here. So you're saying that we're above the fray. Or we're way below it. <laughs> We're, and no one just, no one cares. Okay. So what, it started with Harvey Weinstein. No, mm-hmm. that didn't surprise anybody. Because he's, well, he, the, he's, he's a boorish man. But part of this is, he's always isn't that. part of the story that so-called everybody knew what was going on, yeah. but no one talked. Yeah. I guess that's the story. That's part there. of the story. Yeah. But then Kevin Spacey, said, Woo, that was a, more of a surprise. But see, here's for me the deal. Did okay. you know he was gay? No, because he didn't tell anybody. I knew he was gay. What? Come on, everyone knew. Uh, I did. Honestly, I did. Okay. I'd read something a long time ago. All right, whatever. But but that's not the story. It's it's always struck me how good he was at playing intimidatingly creepy. Yeah. And now you find out, oh, he's typecast. Oh, that's why. Yeah. That's why he was that good. The one at that playing that. The one that really kind of bothers me is Louis C.K. Yeah, then you get Louis C.K. and that's just because part that's of, a big bummer. I mean, man. there's two sides to this. One is I think some of his comedy I, I think is really brilliant. Yeah. But a lot of his comedy was very crude and very crude. And, and sexually inappropriate, but you thought well, it's comedy. Like he, right. I mean, he's, I was he's, not condoning. He's playing a character. Exactly. He's playing a character of like his worst instincts that he right. never actually entertains. Right. Actually. And it, 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 this is like finding out Mel Brooks is actually fond of Hitler. <laughs> Right, which you, is you're not saying that's true. No, no, okay. not at all. Not but but it's, it's like finding out that yeah, that springtime for Hitler was not meant to right. be tongue it was in cheek. Actually, it was an, an, an homage. Right. Yeah. That's what it's like with Louis C.K. You find out the sexual monsters that he sometimes pretends, de- pretends to, to be, be. He really is. Yeah. Okay. 
So, and now uh, Wonder Woman is saying she's not going to be in Wonder Woman 2 unless they fire one of the producers. Yeah, I who's actually like, I, I like her even more now. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. But it just keeps spreading. And, and now they're saying things about Dustin Hoffman. They're saying things about Richard Dreyfus. They're saying things about George Takai. George Takai. Captain Sulu. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Where does it end? I don't they're saying know. they're saying President Bush, H.W. Bush, who's yeah. like 120. Yeah, groped a girl. Is now accused of grabbing. He's a groper. Grabbing girls in the rear. <laughs> I'm, and then I don't know. I mean, where I, I I'm not trying. It's just a Sky, mess. It's you're a, speechless. I am speechless. Sky. Like, and and yeah. It, I mean, part of me feels like this is actually a a Christian moment in our culture, though. Yeah. Well, okay. Here's here's what I'm curious about because like decency and dignity is being is being called forth which is a good thing Hollywood was kind of you know uh, 19 even 1950s and then into the 1960s sexual revolution Hollywood was kind of leading the charge as a reputation as a culture and then as some of their content for throwing off Victorian morals yeah you know we're done with that this is the new generation this is you know this is sexual liberation we're throwing away victorian morality so so in one hand we're saying all right all those old rules about sexuality we're throwing them away we're throwing away the old rules right but now it's kind of like they're saying well wait a minute we threw away all the rules, or some people threw away all the rules. We need some rules. I'll, I'll, hold on. We let need me, some rules. I, let me nuance that a little bit. Okay. I think the more accurate message was we're throwing away the old Victorian rules of sexuality for women. But the problem, but, 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 but the problem is, you're right. They ended up throwing it away for everyone. Yeah. And now you oh, have right. men behaving right. this way, and and that's a problem. Because when, again, and I've said this before. Either sexuality is very, very meaningful or it's not. It's, it's not meaningful sometimes and not meaningful other times. So, so the, I mean, the Victorians clearly said, and the Christian sexual ethic was, this is profoundly meaningful. We are putting it on a pedestal. It is only safe uh, or healthy in this, you know, circle. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. this fairly tight circle that we're drawing, especially you know in the in the heights of, of Victorian Christianity, um, and so then that circle's been expanding, 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 expanding. Partly by saying, "Oh, come on, it's not that meaningful. You can, if you want to have sex with ten people, that's okay. It's up to you. It's yeah, but, not that meaningful." But the the whole this whole current cultural moment is all about consent or the lack thereof. Yeah. Right. So it's not about. Yeah. It's not saying that our sexual morality has has gone off the rails because people are doing things they shouldn't be doing in consensual environments. It's this is all about men doing things against or using their authority or power against the consent of another. Or in the case of the Roy Moore story, a fourteen year old who can't possibly give consent because yeah. You know, so that's more the issue, don't you think? Yeah, it's, you think it's just about consent? Well, I, I think our culture, you're right, is pretty licentious when it comes to anything you want sexually is fine. There's no judgment if, anymore. If everyone's on board. As long as it's consensual. Yeah. It, it just feels like the message to too many men has been, uh, it's no big deal. Sex is no big deal. We thought it was a big deal. It's not a big deal. And then the, the consent thing, they seem to kind of miss that. <laughs> Unless... Well, but here's they the thing. Don't, I, I have a suspicion, and yeah. I can't verify this. Okay. But I think if you were to rewind the tape 50 or 100 years, there would probably be just as many men abusing, doing these kinds oh. of things because they had power and authority over women Yeah. in various environments. The difference is now more women are finding that if they speak up, they're they're not shamed, it, they're not going to be yeah. destroyed, not in every okay, case, but okay. they're finding the courage to speak up. So okay. I don't think anything's changed. Okay, but look at it this way. What? Sky Jatani. Look at it this way. Tell me how to look at it, Philip. A hundred years ago, 130 years ago, there were more than 300 legal brothels in Chicago, just yeah. in the city limits of Chicago. And they were fairly... Uh, commonly visited by upper class 
Chicago men. So you're saying the closing of brothels has forced men to become predatory? <laughs> I'm saying that there was uh, there were rules. It's like, well, if if you want to act on those baser instincts, you don't do it in yeah. in your normal life. You have a separate life. I don't know. I'm I, trying to figure out what's you know. changed. I think <laughs> I think men are a problem. (laughs) They just are. I think men are a problem. And I think for a long time, this kind of behavior has been tolerated by men in power because they're in power and because they make people a lot of money. And women have put up with it for various reasons, both cultural shaming and in some cases because their own careers or futures depended on remaining silent. Right. Uh, Right. And we may be at a moment where that's changing. Though it was different. A hundred years ago, not that many women were worried about their careers. And, yep. and getting into, you know, especially in Hollywood, because Hollywood has always been very male-driven. Did, did you ever see Mad Men? Yeah. Remember the, like, the yeah. early seasons of Mad Men where yeah. the women in the kind of secretarial pool yeah. were all just constantly objectified by yeah, the men? And, right. And, and why did they put up with it? Uh, they needed a job. They needed a job. Yeah. Exactly. So there's always been this structure within society Man. that tolerated. But I just can't. Okay. I was. I was. I was debating this with my sister, who's fairly opinionated. Yeah, I remember. And I was saying, I, th- I think it's worse, and and partly maybe it's worse because, in like among comedians, because any subject is considered okay. Like you know. I'm just the things that Louis C.K. jokes about Mm -hmm. are things you wouldn't have joked about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, oh, and guess what? He does those things. Is that part of the permissiveness permissiveness of the topics we now engage in? Her response was, no, there's always been this culture in Hollywood of the casting couch and getting girls on the casting couch. My response is, yeah, but if I go back to like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, who were the biggest stars in Hollywood. Okay, in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Biggest stars in Hollywood, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, combo. I can picture them hitting on women. You can picture Dean Martin hitting on women. I can't picture Dean Martin doing what Louis C.K. does to women. Yeah, but how do you know? I, here's, I, I'm, I'm going to side with your sister <laughs> on this. Because I, I could I think, picture, it's easy for me to picture Louis C.K. I don't want to know what you're picturing in your head, Phil. Because he talked about it all the time. Okay, but here's the thing. I, I'm going to agree with your sister. I think what's happening is we're, this is a cell phone moment. Like in the last couple of years, we've seen all this video footage come out on cell phones yeah. of African Americans finding themselves in situations where they are abused by police officers. Now, yeah. there's two ways to interpret that. One way is to say uh, abuse from uh, from police officers towards African Americans is a brand new phenomenon, and it's just spiked in the last couple of years. Or yeah. it's always been there, yeah. but now more of it is being exposed because of the prevalence of right. cell phone cameras. Right. right. Similarly, we can say, oh, there's this recent horrible trend of people in Hollywood or in politics or in authority uh, subjugating women and 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 sexually in a non-consensual way engaging them, and it's a sudden development because of the deterioration of our culture. Or yeah. we can say, no, actually, this is. Ac- always been there, okay. but we're having a moment where we're finally talking about it and exposing it, okay. and it's not being kind of brushed under the rug. No, well, that could be. So I think that's more likely what's going on. Should we ask our guest? Sure, because this seems like an area of expertise <laughs> for him, right? <laughs> it's a conversation, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, Keith, so, Keith Getty, yeah. I'm going to introduce you first so they know oh. who you are, and then you oh. can tell us that you don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As a matter of professional integrity. Uh, Keith Getty is a Northern Irish composer best known for pioneering modern hymns such as In Christ Alone, co-written with Stuart Town- Townend. Townend? Why isn't it Townsend? Because there's no S in his name? Yeah, that's weird. I mean, I actually typed that out. I went to Wikipedia to double check it and, and even Autospell tried to correct it. Said, no, you mean Townsend. It's just Townend. Correct, sir. Townend. It's not the town's end. It's... The town, the end of the town end. It's the end of the town. Okay. Doesn't that seem weird to you? No. But isn't Stuart Townsend, he's the uh, drummer for the police, isn't he? Or Stuart, no, Stuart Copeland. He's the composer. Okay. Um, he, Keith also writes with his, with his wife, Kristen. It's estimated that his songs are sung by 100 million people each year in churches around the world. Do you know them? Have you, how many of them have you met? I didn't say that. That was our publishers. That was Integrity Music said that, not me. Yeah, it's, it's been estimated by experts. 
experts say. I was in Korea a few weeks ago, and I'm pretty sure well, one of your songs well, was well, sung well, in that sure. church. <laughs> he has performed at uh, Royal Albert Hall, Carnegie Hall, the Ryman Auditorium, and the Kennedy Center. He and his wife, Kristen, live between Northern Ireland and Nashville. What is between Northern Ireland and Nashville? I'm pretty I, sure you're in the Atlantic. I think it's Nova Scotia. It's pretty okay, close Okay, so you live in Nova Scotia yeah. uh, with their three daughters. And they've recently published a book called Sing, How Worship Transforms Your Life, Family, and Church. I love the movie. Yeah, it was the, that's what it was based on. How much on, did right? you make from the movie rights? I give away the movie rights first. Yeah, that was, that was smart. <laughs> okay, is there anything you want to add <laughs> to this sexual harassment conversation? Is that a, is that a big issue in worship uh, ministry circles? You know what? You know what? It's, you know, you know it's, it's very tragic to hear the things and... Um, but it's not it's not my place to tell people who don't believe how to, how to act, you know. And yeah. um, you know, just just even thinking about as you were talking, it was fascinating to hear the conversation. Thinking back to the the Victorians, for example, you know, I don't, you know, it's I don't want to idealize the Victorians because where there's where there's human breath, there's hypocrisy, and some of the leadership of the Victorian movement was disgusting. But but the base the basis of the Victorian manners thing was 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 based on the, on the, on, the, on Christ love love God and love your neighbors yourself, which was in all in all areas of life you make the other person more comfortable than yourself. So we, you hold a door open for a lady to walk through. Do you know what I mean that's what you do? And thus, when it comes to man, there's an automatic presumption by the Puritans that if a man and woman are left in a place by themselves for a short period of time that's exposed in private, something's going to go wrong. So that's why you know you know if someone wants to date, there was always somebody came with you on a date. You know, men and women were never allowed in a room or a, or a vehicle or, or, or you know, a, you know in any kind of enclosed space by themselves, or or to work together alone for a long period of time because it was automatically presumed. But human nature is such that it's going to go south fast. Right, right. And I and assume so, that they were more concerned about the man in the scenario than the woman. No, but just they're just human. It's just human nature okay. because we, we all, well, you know, it's just human nature. But 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 yes, I, I think to a degree that's true. My bigger concern is that you know, for me as a Christian, for a lot of my friends who have who believe in uh, in Christ in Christ in Judeo Christian values and biblical values, that we, we're not making the same preparation when it comes to addressing workplace behavior when it comes to even taking something like pornography how do we defend ourselves well we're not we're not presuming we're not presuming that bottom line and we're actually in a society that's far more over sex than any society in the history of the world you know we're actually naively going into it with no preparation so i think that's just it was just a reflection you know we we're expecting good results with, with absolutely no preparation right right you know of protection that that, that 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 these victorians were were, were presuming two centuries ago when life was life was much more simple and 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 you know and sexual temptation was not in their face even a fraction as much as it is now. So, yeah. so it was, my concern was just how can we be how can we all how can all of us protect ourselves and our friends and our work colleagues? You know, the, there's a spectrum here, and it doesn't just apply to sexuality, but there's a spectrum on one end is virtue, where somebody is so yeah. virtuous they can be trusted to behave properly in any circumstance. And the other end of the spectrum is deterrence, which is as you're saying, Keith, people can't be trusted, so you put structures in place that deter them from behaving badly. And what we've done as a culture is basically remove all deterrence and trust people's virtue. But, and but, but we but find no, that most people in our culture are not virtuous. So well, now we have no nobody, system by which nobody, to protect anybody. Nobody with, breath, nobody with breath is virtuous. You know, when, when Potiphar's wife tempts Joseph, he doesn't turn around to her and try to explain the meaning of Ephesians to her. You know, he runs the heck out of there as fast as he can because he knows human nature. Do you know what I mean? That's that's the point. Anyway, that's a whole that's a whole. But, I mean, I would yeah. argue though, even running is a it's a virtuous act. Mm -hmm. It's to remove yeah, yourself from the point, he doesn't from trust the, himself to he right. It's, yeah, it's yeah. to recognize your yeah, your own weakness, and right? And discuss, discuss politics. You know. Mm -hmm. So is this part of our our switch? You know, because because the Victorian view of of mankind was that man was innately evil. And needed to be reformed, mm -hmm. and that was the role of Christianity: was reforming a man, turning him from a monster into a saint. And now we're more, much more likely to say, "No, people are born good; they only go bad when you know you corrupt them with bad education, or no education, or mm -hmm. bad parents, or bad friends." But that we're innately good. Is this? Is this the? Are we innately fallen? Well, or in the ir irony is there was an interesting article that was written recently trying to explain 
uh, the gun debate in the United States. And I know this opens a whole other can of worms, but, <laughs> but the article was, was saying that the issue between gun advocates and anti-gun proponents is a fundamentally different vision of humanity and of God, because the argument you often hear from gun proponents is, well, you got to... You got to stop a bad guy with a gun with a good guy with a gun. Yeah. And, and that assumes that each person falls into the category of either good right. or bad. Cleanly. Cleanly. And at all times. And you forget that uh, a person is a completely good law abiding citizen until the moment they break the law. Yeah. And then they're suddenly not. And rather than seeing each person as being good or bad at any given moment and in conflict and capable of either, yeah. it wants to lump a whole bunch of people into the good category and then a whole other group of people into the bad category. And as long as you keep guns away from the bad guys and only give them to the good guys, everyone will be fine. Mm -hmm. That's a really juvenile view of human nature. Yeah. And I think the same thing goes with what you're saying is we think people are just inherently good or inherently bad. And if they're inherently good, then give them all the freedom in the world because they'll never abuse yeah. it. And that's kind of, that's naive. When uh, Selfridge's department store opened in London in 1910, 1915, right around there, there were two things that London had never seen before in Selfridge's department store. Two things no one had seen before in London. Woman's ankles. <laughs> and what's the second one? Uh, the first one is public restrooms for women. There were no public restrooms for women. So they were just unisex. Because women didn't travel outside the home long enough to need them. It wasn't considered safe. You would go from your house to someone else's house. You always had access to a public restroom. A private. I mean, no, to a pr private, private restroom. restroom. Yeah, yeah. The other one. That's pretty much how I do it. The other one that London had never seen before was female elevator operators. Okay. And people said, you can't do that. Men are going to get on the uh -huh. elevator and they're going to assault the female elevator operator. And Selfridge said, <laughs> no, no, this store is a day trip, an outing for women. I want women to feel comfortable shopping without their husbands. And if there's a male elevator operator, they won't feel safe getting on the elevator alone with a male elevator operator. So we're gonna have female elevator operators so that women can do something they've never done before in London, have day trips shopping without their husbands. And go to public bathrooms in groups. And be able to go to the bathroom and safely ride an elevator. Okay, that was just 100 years ago in human history that women felt safe enough in London to go on an outing. So are you saying we've done well or done poorly since then? I'm saying that it's, it's relatively recently that both the rule of law and um, Victorian morality made a safe space for women in the public sphere and I'm just wondering if we're, if we're holding it up as well as we should. I don't know. All right. But that's just me. Okay. Let's talk. Uh, Keith Getty, you were born. Where were you born? Born in the north of Ireland in a city called Lisburn near Belfast. Oh, okay. Northern yeah. Ireland. Did, did you grow up with you two? Um, you know, I didn't grow up with them, so to speak. Obviously, their music was, their music was growing as I was growing. So um, Okay. Definitely part of culture, but I, I was more of a classical musician, to be honest. That was more my... Oh, okay. My, you, you didn't put together a rock band in, in junior high? No, I didn't. No. None, none of that kind of stuff. I was like, I, I, I did put a lot of groups together, but it was more like, you know, madrigal groups and chamber orchestras and that <laughs> kind of stuff. Did you find that was a good way to get the girls? That was, it, that, that really was a problem. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, playing the flute, I'm playing the flute didn't help. And when I told them I was going to write hymns someday... Yeah, it was, so so it was slow progress in that area. That, that's really that's like a step below the AV club. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah I, anyways, you know, my Kristen's, Kristen's brother is an, is an Oscar nominated movie director. Do you know what I mean? And then Kristen married a, a hymn writer. You know, so it's like <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when did you know? When did you write your first a piece of music? And when did you know this is what I'm going to do with my life? Well, I never, I never actually did anything else. I mean, for, for my, well, I, until 10, I wouldn't play music because I wanted to, be, wanted to play football for Liverpool. That's, that's what you, I think you in America call that soccer, what we in the rest of the world call football. And then, and then uh, but at 10, I realized, uh, I realized I was more into music than football. So, so that, that kind of took over. Um, you know, music, music, you know, it's a wonderful thing. I was asked, to, I was part of a, pa I was part of a discussion group in the, in the British Church Times last month on this theory that the entire collapse of the Church of England is because of the collapse of, of children's choirs. 
this guy said it's nothing to do with liberal seminaries and right no none of that and and the the the, the sexualization the, liber, the liberalization of british society or even the multi-religions in british societies in particular islam it's it's all to do with the fact that they stop they stop basically they stopped capturing children's imaginations in the local villages wow. 30 40 years ago it was a fascinating it was a fascinating discussion but but i i, I actually had tremendous sympathy for the article because i brought i was brought up in a home, a very conservative home, but my parents loved music. They loved classical music. They loved creativity, and uh, and so it brought me. It brought me into church. It brought me into church life. It gave me mentors. It gave me friends. It even gave me occasional girlfriends, even if it wasn't the ones I wanted. But the point was, I was surrounded. I was surrounded by you know the word of God and people around me, which which actually captured my imagination, hmm. and uh, and so I was very thankful for that. And uh, and I think, and it, it kind of has given me a lifelong desire to help. To help children really yeah. you know, grasp grasp faith, and I mean, in that discussion with the Church Times, it was interesting because in the best of cases, children grow up with a holistic understanding of a God who loves creativity and beauty, but also with understanding the story of redemption, making the church making the church their home, and having good role models and friends. In the worst of cases, it makes people believe that the local the local parish is their friend. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so, mm-hmm. and so, so, so I was very, th- that, that was a very important sort of first step in my life. And when I think of this, even in my mid twenties, I realized there's songs I've been singing for 15 years now. And the songs I was singing in youth group and in church, I realized I was not going to sing for another five years. Do you know what I mean? And so there began to become modern worship is not inherent. Well, modern worship is not inherently wrong, but, but we need something else. We need something that's more substantive. It's not consistent with, the patterns of worship in the Old Testament, New Testament, or, or indeed throughout the Church Fathers. And so that's why we started to write in 2000, to write the modern hymns. So go, mm-hmm. going back to the, the theory that the loss of children's choirs led to the, the deterioration of the church, what led to the loss of the choirs themselves? Was it the shift in music styles away from traditional hymns yeah, toward contemporary? That was contempor- an awful lot of it, yeah. That was an awful lot of it. You know, you know, the, you know the people tend to think of the hymn movement from hymns to, 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 pop, to pop worship songs as being, you know, basically just we're, we're, we're trying to be relevant towards young people. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we're, we're looking up on a screen and clapping our hands and raising our hands instead of holding a hymn book. But yet so much, so much was lost in the, in the, in the, trans, in the transformation, you know, you know, you know, so authentic worship was understood before them as being an authentic picture of the God of the Bible that you sing to in the songs you sing. It then became a quiver in your liver. Do you know what I mean? You know, similarly, the sense that, the sense that we only sing because we're part of a body, so in other words, we sing songs that as a family we sing together and the family units themselves sings together and we cultivate the next generation as children through all that really was lost. And so and so um so I, I think I think I think alongside the modern worship song there's a need there's a need there, there is a need for for substantive modern hymns that we sing. But even more than that, and the generation we live in, I believe, is the most exciting generation in church history. There are more Christians in the world at any point in history. The Bible's in more language. If you more there be more converts in the last century. So the need, to, but but most people are first, second, third generation Christians. And even places like like English speaking West, which has a Christian history, you know, is, is, is throwing out most of the heritage of the songs we sing. And so the need, you know, Charles Dickens, you know, and I think it was a tale of two cities. So this is, we, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. Well, right. that, that's, that's, really what we, that's, mm-hmm. that's what we live in now. But the need to build deep believers is so, is so imperative right now. And Luther 500 years ago this year, talked about the reformation of the church happening through the preaching and the singing of the word. You know, he, he believed that, you, that the preacher explains what's happening in the Bible during the service, and you carry the words out of the church by singing them. Because singing them yeah. puts them in your mind and your memory. It puts them in your hearts and your emotions. It puts them in your prayers and your words, and ultimately your life and witness and legacy. And it would have been a total anathema to Martin Luther. That, that you would have a, for somebody who teaches the Bible for 40 minutes, then you would sing a song, a silly song at the end that tickles your emotions and gives you kind of a good feeling as you walk out because you've been concentrating for 40 minutes. To me, almost like a, almost like a sort of the, the, the music at the end of Jimmy Fallon show. And so, and so I think, you know, that, that is, we're at a critical point in history and um, we're privileged to get to do what we do. I think my question was, uh, when did you write your first piece of music? <laughs> so... <laughs> That was a pretty good answer. <laughs> when did you look at it? I want to. I want to. I don't want to leave your story quite yet. Uh, well, when did you do something that you know where you realized, hey, I could actually this could be what I do actually for my vocation? You know, how did you? How were you discovered 
What was your first song that you know put you on whatever you would call the the worship no, no. hymn map? Well, if you I mean the, the professional answer to that is in terms of the hymns, yeah, is the first hymn that we wrote that was released was in Christ Alone, which kind of blew the door open for doing stuff. So okay, I've been in a, I've been in a seventeen year decline since then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of in terms of early years. Um, in terms of earliest, we just I just kept writing music every Christmas. I, I kept falling in love with girls at Christmas and writing so writing writing like little carols and that kind of stuff and getting them to sing the solos. And it kind of was good preparation for eventually meeting Kristen and writing for her. And uh, but you know, um, gosh, a lot of it was also failure. You know, to be honest, you know, I, I I was trying to be a good guitar player, and then I messed up my big exam, so I became a flute player, and I got a scholarship to study with James Galway, and he told me I was never going to make it either. Oh. I should do, do arrangements. Then I started to do arrangements. And I was thinking I was going to be a film composer, and but the best friends were the ones with songs. So I kind of fell backwards into songwriting, you know. I sort of, I, I, honestly, that's been my, my my whole life. Is you know, you you, you do the you, you do the next thing to the best of your ability to the glory of God. You try to be you try to be innovative. You try to you try to have a you know business like approach to everything you do as well. And and doors just move. And uh, but but looking back now, there's, there's nothing in life I'd rather have done than, than write hymns for God's people. Yeah. You know? So were you? Um, as you're going through all this, I'm a flute player, I'm a guitar player, I'm, a, I'm going to be a film composer. Did you have a very active pursuit of God in those days? Yeah. Or, yeah, or think, one day did you decide, actually, I'm going to write worship hymns, I better start pursuing God? No, no. So so church music was it was, was the thing that really drew me into faith. And, and all my early things, I would say up to 18 that was core to all my life. It was it was it was it was core to everything. It was what I listened to. It was what I was most passionate about. I went I went to a pagan country, to university. It's called England. You may have heard of it. It's kind of <laughs> the east of Ireland. And you know, I was trying to I was trying to re- I, I got involved in the union debating and all that kind of stuff as soon as I arrived at university. I figured if I can beat enough people up in arguments and could really smash them and humiliate them, they're going to like fall down on their knees and ask what can I do to be saved. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> so, exactly. I wanted, I wanted to force feed the whole, this whole university to Christianity, you know, like with this kind of like ridiculous, you know, colonialist kind of approach. And, uh, you know, so, so my first two debates, one were with a guy who did, one was with a guy who done theology, having converted from Islam and then turned back to Islam to convert people to Christianity. The other one was with a guy who did his, his MPhil in theology with Don Cupid, who was, Brit, who was Britain's first um, atheistic bishop. Atheistic bishop, uh, atheistic, sorry, atheistic Anglican minister, and so uh, b- basically that gave me a, it almost gave me an inoculation of what twenty first century Christianity is. Not it's world religion at one end and no religion, no religion, and it's sort of you know militant atheism at the other, and those things really helped me a lot uh, to to wake up fast and go okay how are we gonna, how are we going to work all this out and trying to understand faith. John Lennox, you know, the Oxford professor, was a huge help at that time from the Lennox Dawkins debates. Mm-hmm. And actually, ironically, introduced me to his niece three years later, who was Kristen. No um, way. So he, yeah, yeah, so he's Kristen's dad's brother is John Lennox. So that, wow. Hmm. And so that was kind of a real unique thing. And uh, Yeah, very cool. Okay, so you uh, write some stuff. Uh, people like it. They start singing it all over the place. Uh, people start writing hyperbolic statements about you on Wikipedia. Uh, you have a, a, a genuine hit song. Um, now you're part of an industry, the worship music industry. You have a publisher. You have a distribution company. They and they come back to you, I assume, and say, "Can you write another one of those hit songs? Because those really help us when you write <laughs> hit songs." How do you how do you deal with the the conflict? You know, kind of the tension between. Uh, the system saying, hey, can we get another hit song out of you and just trying to follow God where he leads you sure. musically? Well, there's there's three, there's three or four answers to that question that I think are important. Number one, the first corrective, I signed my first publishing songs to a private Christian charity, which after they got in Christ alone, they sold, they sold to EMI. <laughs> so so, so, so in, 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 a, in a blast of what was a very holy act, but well motivated, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so after that, we've owned everything ourselves. So we manage ourselves. We own our own record label. We own our own publishing. We own, we own every single part of it. So the only devil we have to fight when we fight really is the one that's inside me. Okay, so is, tell us about that. Which is no small battle in itself. Well, I think there's several things. I think, I think in life, you know, we have to work out what we're about and uh, what the Lord has called us to do. 
and, and, and see our priorities at that level. Um, so f- for us, for example, right back from in 2000 in writing hymns for the church, we had those three goals. One was to write hymns that teach the Bible. The second was to write hymns that, that congregations of each generation can sing together. And then thirdly, I guess, this dream, you know, this dream of trying to write more, in a, t- take more classic forms of art. So in the same way as my friends like Matt and Chris and all the guys that write worship songs, their, their real goal with a worship song is to write a song that, 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 that resonates with the moment. Do you know what I mean? That, that yeah. hits Christian right over here. Our, our goal was really, let's write, let's write more, let's take poetry and theology and classic hymnody and classical music and, and traditional art. Let, let's write him, let's write in a style that maybe people can carry with them. That will be a dream. Now, of course, that's, in a way, that's a little bit of a lofty speculative thing, but but that was, I guess, the three goals. I mean, a hymn book, for example, a hymn book, for example, the, the judgment of a song was not, does this speak to the moment? A hymn book was, could we sing this for the duration of the publication, whether it's 20 or 50 years. So it's a different lens you look through things like. So so that was, so philosophically, we knew this is what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. We're not using this as a springboard to get a country deal, even though, you know, Alison Krauss and Lyle Lovett, all these people sing our songs. We're not using it to get a CCM deal. We're not using it to become a film composer. We're using it to try and write hymns that teach the Bible to the church for the rest of our lives. So that's, that's our life's work. And in one sense, there's a security with that. You know, I think one of the one of the things Alistair Begg taught me earlier on as a as a pastor to me was was that in your professional life, you're responsible for the management of your giftings and in your church life, you honor your church leaders. What I've noticed and I say this, you know, I don't say this in in an arrogant way because I could have been the same if it wasn't for him. So what we've tried to do is make sure that we know the numbers and the priorities of our business. We manage our staff. We have 17, 18 staff here. You know, we, we manage our staff. We take, we take control of, we, we take control of everything and take responsibility for everything. Um, but when we walk into church on a Sunday, whether I'm leading or whether I'm sitting in the fourth row with my kids, my job is to honor my church leaders and to support the people who are sitting beside me. And if somebody lost their job last week, to invite them to my home. My job is to serve people, honor my leaders. Nashville seems to do the flip what I've noticed most times where if you've got your, your, I mean, it comes to your personal skill set, you would almost sell anything if you can get the promise of music or success or awards and let somebody else manage everything. So almost every artist in town is depending on somebody else or blaming somebody else. And so they have actually no control over the skill set they've been given. And most of them, most of them have got some level of victim mentality as if they've been treated badly. Um, and they'll even use words like screwed. Now, if you come from Belfast, you know screwed means somebody ju- somebody jammed your head down a toilet and put a gun in the back of your head and told you to do something. Not one of them were not one of them were screwed. They all quite willingly signed documents. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, then, and, then when, and then when it comes into church, they do the opposite. They they suddenly want to be the leader. They want to be the star. They want to dishonor the leadership of the church. It becomes a platform for them, rather than no, I honor my leader. I'm, I may want to do this song on Sunday, but. If the pastor decides he wants to do something different and changes at the last minute, and it's usually a stupid idea, I honor him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. My job is to honor my church. So, so I think understanding those things are important. And I think the other thing I've learned over the years is, is, is just the importance of your marriage. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I get asked, because, because our music is used so much among the, what do we call the theological community, um, both, both, you know, from seminaries to theologians to, to, to serious Bible churches, and I mean serious in every sense of the word sometimes, um, <laughs> so much by those guys, they're always asking me, what theologian has interviewed you the most? And they're trying to work out, you know, is it, is it Tim Keller? Is it, you know, who, who's your, who's your what, what club are you in? Right. And, I always have to say the theologian that influences me the most is my wife because and it kind of it kind of narks some of them you know what i mean gets, gets them a little bit i did partly because it winds them up but but it's actually a very serious point and that is that you know the home is where christianity begins you know it's where faith begins it's where singing begins you know when i when i when i tell my i can tell my i can tell anybody something i can tell you something here about my 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 goal with something or my motive for something and my wife knows if i'm knows if I'm blowing smoke up, you know what? Do you know what yeah, I mean? she, yeah. she immediately knows. But at the same time, she also knows the heartbreak I have at trying at trying to do the right thing. At trying to do the right thing by people and never yeah. being respected. Yeah. Uh, you know, so is so, it it must be really different sitting in Northern Ireland at a parish church trying to write a hymn than sitting in Nashville surrounded by every Christian record label in the world and 400 wannabe Christian pop stars and trying to write a hymn. 
It is, it is and it's not. It is. I mean, we live we live from September to June. We live in Nashville. I'm here in my office in Nashville. It's our office is part of our actual local church. So my pastor's my pastor's room is five doors down. Okay. And, uh, so, so, so in one sense, it is. And the three months that we spend in Ireland in the summer, as well as being the funnest three months you could possibly imagine in your wildest dreams, you know, is actually it is actually a grinding time as well because mm. I go back to people who don't really care. Do you know what I mean? And uh, and yeah. and and your family and relatives. We go to we go to these like we just have, our summers are brilliant. We've big, big, we've both got very large families, and they all hang out in the north coast of Ireland all summer. It's a brilliant fun. We play golf and all that kind of stuff, and go to beach missions with thirty seven relatives on the one. We had thirty seven relatives at a picnic. I mean, can you imagine that? <laughs> I must have that twice. So it's <laughs> so it's very there, there's a groundedness to that that is important for me. Okay, so you think that that is a a, a key yeah. kind of balancing yeah. point. But at for the same you. time, but at the same time, the biggest devil is inside you. You know, yeah. and yeah. I remember talking. I remember talking to Bill Gaither about it once because I thought, and, and it was an interesting because I thought in his thing he mustn't be jealous of that many people. And his his good advice was just to be honest. You know, we signed a song. We signed a song with a guy last year. We have, a, we have a publishing company here, and we signed a song with a guy called He Will Hold Me Fast that I think is better than anything I've written for five years. And the guy said, "How did you know? How did you know this song was going to work?" And I said, "I had this." intuitive feeling inside my stomach i said and i just i i was so jealous of you i hated you for like <laughs> quite a long time. I, said, I said and i'm not a hateful person i said so you know if i feel that jealous immediately about something yeah my body so, so <laughs> I could with it was going, okay so why am i so annoyed about this song <laughs> Could it be I didn't think of it first? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so I think the only way, you know, a lot of it is, you know, if you have the security of a, of a, of a strong marriage and family and church, and when I say church, I mean church, but also good friends in yeah. the church, you know, you know, then I think, I think you, you can have that level of being honest. And um, I don't know, that's just, that's just off the cuff answer. Okay, to you. Know, cool. Uh, okay, the book, you wrote a book. You're, su- you're supposed to write songs. You're not supposed to write books. Now you're treading on author's uh, turf. What, the book's called uh, Sing, How Worship yeah. Transforms Your Life, Family, and Church. Why did you write it? What's the, what's the point? Well, you know, in some ways, it's, it's a summary of each. We, we do 12. My wife and I give 12 weeks a year. This is the last year. We're only doing six weeks from next year. But we do 12 weeks a year of touring. So we, our touring company, which is one of our companies, is, is built around 60 events a year that we do in these 12 weeks. And every time we come to a city, I do a free leadership lunch, which is basically just talking about why we write and all that kind of stuff. And it was really interesting. In 2013, I asked, I asked a whole bunch of churches. I said, what's, if I was to ask you now, what's the music like in your church? Or what was the music like last Sunday? Are you doing a staff meeting tomorrow and you talk about the music in church? How would you describe it? And in 13 leadership lunches, not one person said, how did the congregation sing? Hmm. It was weird. It was about the songs. It was about hymns or worship songs, worship mm-hmm. leaders, bands, volume, smoke, technology, you know, getting on with the worship, you know, all these good questions. But nobody, and, and yet, you know, what we understand from, from scripture is that, is that, is that the, holy act, the holy act is the congregation singing. That's what we're commanded to do. That's what we're created to do. That's what the gospel compels us to do. And so the holy privilege for us church musicians is to make beautiful music. And set it in the same way as those wonderful film composers you used in your movies, you know, took all their skill to try and make a scene look more beautiful. So right. our, 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 our job as, as songwriters and keyboard players and arrangers is to help God's people sing as beautifully as possible. That is, that is the whole artistic point. Uh, the whole musical point of getting together. Now, I have an expansive, I'm, I'm very Martin Luther-esque, so I have a very expansive view of the use of arts. I, I believe music can be used a hundred different ways in church, but the primary role is congregational singing. And our job is to help God, the body of people to sing better. It's, it's a picture of what God's family is. And so we wanted to basically teach congregational singing and then look at, look at the various aspects, what, what it means, how it changes me as an individual, how it changes me in my family life, how it changes me in our congregation, and how it is a radical witness to the communities around us. Hmm. So if, it, if, if it's supposed to change our family life, does that mean our kids are supposed to be singing with us and not off singing their own song somewhere else? Well, I do believe that the singing, you know, it's interesting to go back to the New England Pure. I mean, well, I'll tell you what, we were in a concert in L.A. once, and the kids were just, comp- were just, they were just being brats, they were climbing all over us. And I suddenly realized, I have to go to co- for coffee at Panera, with all people, with John MacArthur, 
So I arrived at my car, I'm going like, ba, ba, da, 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 da. He says, how are you? And I went, any advice on raising kids? I don't even know why I said it. It was one of those kind of stupid things you say when you're just like, <laughs> what do I say? I got to be careful what I say here. And, uh, and he said, well, he says, it actually begins with the songs you sing in your home. And I was expecting to go doctrine, teaching, sermons, yeah. whatever, yeah. whatever, you know, that I must do that. No, no, it was, it was, and the New England Puritans didn't allow a man to take the Lord's Supper on a Sunday if he wasn't singing and praying with his kids every day. You know, so it, you know, the, 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 even even the American Sunday schools was a movement that began as singing schools. You know, where going back to the Luther principle that you know you, you you learn it through the teaching, but you actually you actually let something go deep into your heart. You write it in your hearts by singing. It. You know, and so and so you know, you know, as I look back in my childhood, I think about dads that didn't sing in church where their kids are today, and. And uh, you know, and so it's a challenge. It's not not every home is the, not every home is the von is the, is the, is the von Trapps, and I understand that. But but we have whether whether we sing out loud in a kind of a four part harmony way, or whether we just use this technology called the iPhone that seems to be ripping families to shreds, you know, and actually use that and redeem that to just have songs in the background, like like you know we, we do our kids hymnal or. My kids prefer your hymnal, your 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 details. You know, so yeah. sing along, which makes me sick, but that's fine. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. At least you know, at least they're, at least they're filling their minds and their hearts with things of the Lord, and and it begins there. And so my wife always says, you know, Sunday worship is a is, is a meal that's prepared during the week, and mm-hmm. and it is it is true. On Sunday at our church, you know, Eliza Eliza knew Eliza knew one of the songs, and she was she's six years old, and she was singing beside me. You know, they sort of putting their hands in there, and I was going, "Okay, steady on, sweetheart. You're not as Presbyterian." You know? but, but but the point, but the point was, <laughs> but, but, but it was it was interesting watching that transition. Now, she, yeah. She, how she, how old is your oldest? She's six. Yeah. Oh, she's your oldest. Eliza Joy is. Yeah. Okay, so you got three. Who's the youngest? Six, three, and two. There's actually a fourth one that's minus four months. Okay. <laughs> that's making my wife really mad right now. Okay. <laughs> How do you, are you nervous about the transition with your kids from, I'll listen to whatever daddy's listening to, to I won't listen to anything daddy's listening to? Well, it's all ahead of me, so I can't, I can't speak <laughs> with, any real, with any real, you know, n- knowledge. I know yeah. for me, you know, you know the, the songs you plan, I mean, it, we just did a project called Facing a Task Unfinished about how the hymns that were sung by missionaries you know, propel them towards mission and, and sustain them in their hardest years. And of course, there was two, as we studied missionaries, there's two, there's ones who had radical conversions, but the other kind were the ones who grew up in Christian homes. And in every single case, it was the hymns they sang as kids that sustained them and that fired them hmm. and, and that propelled them towards great things. So, so you know, I, I certainly don't know what tomorrow brings, but I know I know this is one great way we have of planting something in our kids that's, that's rich. I, I, I do think it's important to be listening to what our kids are singing. I do think if our kids are musical, it, it's a wonderful way to foster them into the church. Um, but I can't give you wise answers for those questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll ask you in 10 years. So yeah. what do you think about the, I mean, I assume this is in your book. I'm sorry, I haven't read it, but the trend toward, I've been in so many worship environments over the last number of years where the music coming from the front is so loud and so overpowering that I can't even hear myself sing, let alone anybody else. What What's driving that kind of model of, of music in the church today? I, I don't know. I, I want to be cautious. I mean, you know, it's interesting, you know, the, the, the Phil, Phil asked a question about the industry, and I think church leadership has to be re- realistic and go, we have to teach our congregations why they sing and then encourage the congregation to sing and let it begin there. One of our recommendations with the Sing Book is at every church for a year, the only question we ask about music every Sunday, whether it's an old whether it's an old organ church in Glen Ellen or whether it's a rocker church downtown Chicago, is you know, is the only question we should be asking is is how did the congregation sing? So we need to begin to teach our congregations, but also the we can't be naive to the industry. If you look at Judeo Christian history, what was sung in church? Or sung or chanted in church was always psalms or or liturgy or localized singing in communities that wouldn't be interrupted by other communities or or with Luther in the printing press and afterwards the hymn books. Now the, the problem with what we have now is is with with any song accessible anywhere. This is the first generation in human history that what's being sung in churches isn't curated by the church leaders. It mm. is not it is not overseen by the church leaders. And so, and given that, given also that, and also given the reality that the only difference between the Christian music industry being bankrupt forever and still floating is the money that they're making out of church church worship right now. 
you know, it means that you've got you've got Wall Street companies belting all their publicity into the church all the time to try and sell stuff. So I think yeah. there's a real call hmm. on pastors to grow up and take a lead in their churches and actually take responsibility for the words that they're planting into their congregations' minds. Wow. Wow. We can't outsource that to Wall Street, huh? Take that, pastors. I think Wall Street has a pretty good feel for what we should be singing in church, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, so, you know... Apparently, Wall Street determines how we vote yeah. and what we buy. And sales don't lie. And what we worship. Yeah. If, it, if yeah. it sells... Sky. No, well, it, it's know, like it's like Christian publishing. That's you what know? I was just it's, gonna say. It's, if the, it, it's a hit book, it must be theologically sound. I remember the the first uh, book proposal I sent to a publisher many years ago was rejected because the publisher loved it, but they feared that it would undermine their business model because it was critiquing Christian consumerism. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> you publish it yourself. Well, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's uh, well, well. You just did that with well, your yeah. I, your I latest did book. A book. So, if anyone really wants to support the independence of of the church, please get my book. What's wrong with religion? Yeah, that's right. Okay, mm-hmm. and the uh, Keith's book um, is sing exclamation point sing how worship transforms your life, family, and church. And how can people learn more about you? What's your website? Where? Wh- what's your uh, home address so they can show up at your house? Oh, please do. Please do. My, wife, my wife's an introvert. She'd love that. Uh, <laughs> a, a pregnant introvert. That's the best kind. <laughs> For their fourth child. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Gettingmusic.com is our okay. website. And then... Um, and uh, there's lots of opportunities to buy the book or buy it, buy it en masse for your church. Broadman and Holman, Lifeway. It's a Lifeway stores, Lifeway website. They publish oh, cool. it too. They're thankful to them cool. as well. All right. I got to sum it up with a song. I'm going to Amazon. I got to sum it up with a song. Mm-hmm. Oh, Keith Getty. He writes a lot of songs. Churches all over. They love to sing along. But Keith Getty, he likes to make it deep so that he thinks that we all can keep the focus on God. It shouldn't be odd. We can suffer bad weather if we just learn to sing together. Sky, why are you looking at me like that? Because I think that was a pretty good one. I'm thinking of Keith's standard question. That was a pretty good one. Which should be, how did the people sing along? And I, I don't think that qualifies. They sing along! And grow richer in theology. Keith, was that okay? Because Sky thinks it, it was terrible. Well, just, just turn the whole thing completely 180. I'll be the executive and say, we really appreciate your song. Have you signed the publishing to anyone? No, no, but we can discuss that later after the show. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Okay, uh, buy Sky's book. It's still available. If you want to, uh, uh, faithblocks.com, B-L-O-X, faithblocks.com, short devotional videos for your kids produced by yours truly. And uh, read uh, Keith's new book. It sounds pretty cool. Sing. Thanks, How do you read good. a book called Sing? Can you sing a book called Read? You can read a hymn. Could you sing the book out loud to your kids? I'm sure someone could. Is the audio version sung or read? Keith? It's read by my wife. You get the audio version of my wife, oh. but she actually does sing on the audio version of the book. She does sing the hymns that she quotes. Why? Well, I, I find that the That's Irish, fantastic. the Irish accent sort of has that melodic. Yeah, I know. Rhythm it's, to he's, it. So, he's been singing this yeah. whole time. Exactly. Yeah. He's been yeah. singing this whole time. Okay, we will be back next week with uh, maybe a guest. I don't know what's going on. We'll next see what's week. going. We'll on. see what's going More on. More sexual harassment news. Oh, please no. Uh, thanks, Keith, for being on the show, and we will see you all next week. Goodbye. See you guys. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. Oh,